Well, um, it's been about a year since we came here. And I do remember it's exactly one year because it was December, in the last Sunday of December 2018, um, that we came here. It's great to be back. Uh, God has been good. Um, today, I, I just want to encourage all of us with a word um, that I have entitled uh, Divine Antidote to Anxiety. Divine Antidote to Anxiety. You know, this, this season where we celebrate the Advent, one key thing that comes to mind is peace. You know, when the angels announce the birth of the Son of God, the peace on earth, on all those whom his favor rests. Uh, when Jesus resurrected in the saw the disciples, they were afraid. He said, peace be unto you, do not be afraid. So uh, the coming of Christ is always characterized by peace. And when we have Christ, we have the peace of God. Um, the issue of anxiety is uh, pretty challenging in our times. I think we, are, we can all relate to that. Uh, when I was preparing this message, I got some few uh, thoughts or some statistics about anxiety that were pretty staggering, but uh, kind of helps us to understand how anxiety is really troubling or causing a lot of issues in our world. I got this from a national uh, prevalence data. I said that the national prevalence data indicate that nearly 40 million people in the United States, that is 18%, experience an anxiety disorder in any given year. And then approximately 8% of children and teenagers experience an anxiety disorder uh, with most people developing symptoms before the age of 21. And according to the World Health Organization, um, one in 13 globally suffers from anxiety. Um, the report indicate that the anxiety disorders are the most common mental disorders worldwide with specific phobia, major depressive disorder, and social phobia being the most common anxiety disorders. So um, we can see so it's a global issue, it's a global um, challenge. And as humans, we, we have so many ways of combating this. Uh, we use psychology, counseling, medicine. But as people of God, or as Christians, I believe God has one of the surest uh, way for us to combat anxiety. And um, the scripture that I read uh, from Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, you know, this is just the, at the outset of Jesus' ministry when he had called the first two disciples and was um, gaining fame. And, of course, a lot of people were following him. And this is actually taken from the Sermon on the Mount. And if you remember, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went up on the mountain and spoke to, the, to his disciples. So um, this statement or this passage was addressed to people who had relationship with Christ, people who were, I mean, disciples of Christ. They were not just ordinary people, or, I mean, um, the, the general public. So without a relationship with Christ, it, was, it would be difficult to even carry out uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So I just want us to note that uh, the teachings here were addressed to people who had relationship with Christ. And it's interesting, even in the old, I mean, that time, uh, over 2,000 years ago, the disciples, based on what Jesus said, you could determine that they were also fighting anxiety. And um, they, these were Jews. And at the time, perhaps the Roman occupation, uh, the imperialism, unfair political treatment, and even just the affairs of life uh, could make them anxious. You know, so it was meet for Jesus to tell them, um, therefore, do not be anxious. I mean, it is implicit that these were people who were also fighting with um, issues with anxiety. And one thing I want us to note that um, is that focusing on God's love and care is the surest way to combat anxiety. Um, focusing on God's love and care is the surest way uh, to combat anxiety. I will just explain it a bit when I'm ending this message, but I want to look at from this scripture what anxiety does and what anxiety means um, to the believer. Um, whenever we are anxious, we need to understand what is happening and so that it will help us to you know, direct our attention and focus on God. Um, the first thing I want us to note is that anxiety 
often arises uh, from misconception of the value of life. Um, anxiety often arises when people misconceive uh, the value of life. When you look at verse um, 25 of Matthew chapter 6, um, Jesus said that, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And he asked this question, Is not life more than the food and the body more than clothing? I believe that this was not just a rhetorical question. He wanted us to think about it. That it's not life more than food or the body more than clothing. So if you look at what he said here, and then if you move to verse 31, where um, he says that, the Bible says that, I mean, therefore do not be anxious about anything. Um, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? And then 32 says that, the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. Jesus in this scripture is telling us that um, when you see life, or when you value life, when you consider life as um, material things, or riches, or possessions, or uh, physical things, you are want or you are inclined to be anxious when you don't have that. When you think that life is all about what you have, it's not about who you have or who you are as a child of God, you will be tempted to be anxious. And uh, in this scripture, I say that it's not life more than food. It means that to Jesus, life is more than what we eat and what we wear. But it's um, pretty tricky when you, you look at the Gentiles, they seek after all these things because they think that that's what makes their life valuable. You know, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 12, when, before Jesus shared the same story, I mean, shared the same passage, I mean, this particular um, statement, he talked about uh, the rich man, and, you know, he was teaching, somebody said that, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance uh, with me, and he said that, who, who, who made me a judge over you? And Luke 12, he said that, be careful of all covetousness, because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So to, to Jesus and to God, um, the life of the believer, a life of uh, the, the human is not in what he has. The life of a human being is in God, because God breathed life into man. And when we become children of God, it becomes even clearer, it becomes more evident, because we understand that our life is in God. In Colossians, when Paul talks about uh, we fixing our eyes on things above because we died and our life is in God. So when we see that life is not about things, it's rather in God, it keeps us from being anxious. But when we see that life is about the things that we have, then if we don't have them, of course, we will be anxious. And interestingly, you notice that how you see life determines what you seek in life. You know, when you see life as um, life is a relationship with God, life is, has a source in God, then everything that you seek, you seek that uh, with that mindset, and you align all your pursuits, you align all your relationship, and everything that you do um, with the will of God. So that is one key thing that Jesus was pointing out, that our life is in God. Our life is in God. It's not in the things um, that we have. And then the other thing that anxiety does, according to this passage, is that anxiety often neglects um, the obvious providential message. The obvious message from God. You know, when you are anxious, you, you neglect it. You even overlook it and you forget it. Um, if you look at um, verse 26, it said, Look at the birds of the air. Uh, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bands, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You know, and then he continues by saying that, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his, his life? And it, it goes on to talk about the lilies of the valley, how they grow, they need a toil or spring, but even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like them. So he's saying that if God, God takes care of the lilies of the valleys and then the birds of the air, why won't he take care of you? And when you wake up and you see the birds chirping, you see and the trees, and you see creation in order. It is um, a message from God that if he's taking care of creation, then he's going to take care of you, um, uh, his child. 
Uh, but when we are anxious, we, we, we neglect that message. Uh, when we are anxious, we neglect that uh, every sound of creation that we hear is God's voice to us saying that, um, I'll, I'll have this, I'll take care of you. Um, and when we are anxious, we are unable to um, enjoy what God has given us freely. We're not, we're not able to even worship God. These things that God has given us is supposed to generate worship, thanksgiving, um, uh, because we know that God has given us creation. He's providing for creation, and he provides for us and our families. You know, but when we are anxious, we neglect that, and we are not able to worship God, and uh, we feel anxious, even though God is evidently, or he's clearly pointing our, our minds and our attention to what he's doing already and what uh, he wants to do in our life. So uh, anxiety neglects the obvious providential message uh, from God. And um, the third one about anxiety is that anxiety is unproductive from this uh, scripture, from what Jesus said. Anxiety is unproductive. Actually, I'll say anxiety is um, counterproductive. You know, uh, from this statement, I mean, this passage, Jesus says that uh, which of you by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. And uh, when he was talking about, uh, do not be worried about what you eat or what you, you, you wear, and he said that you, you know, you, your heavenly father knows that you know all these things, and he says that you of little faith. Anxiety is unproductive. And when we are anxious from this scripture, we are not able to do anything. We are not able to add anything to our lives. Anxiety cannot add anything to our lives. It's like not even uh, anything to the span of your life. And we, we know from, from experience and from um, what we hear that anxiety is counterproductive to your health. Anxiety brings a lot of disorders, as you know, I read from the statistics. It brings a whole lot of um, health issues. And it's even counterproductive to your faith. Uh, Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. So when you are anxious, Anxiety is an expression of um, unbelief, you know. So when you are anxious about your life, you are indirectly telling God that you don't, you don't believe or you don't know or you don't accept that he will take care of you. Um, a great evangelist, um, the 19th century evangelist, a uh, German evangelist named George Muller made this statement that um, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith um, is the end of anxiety. You know, when we are, we, are, we, are, we are not, when we are anxious, we are unable to demonstrate faith in God. I read a story about um, a man from Faith Web. I read, I read a story about a man who met death on the streets. Uh, death came to his town and he met death and he asked him, what are you here for? He said, I'm coming to take 100 people from this town. And he said, wow, that is horrible. He said, no, that is what I do for a living. And the man just went round, went from room to room, from house to house, to just warn people that death is in this place. It's going to take a lot of people. And so you got to protect yourself, get in there. So he does what he can. And then by the end of the day, he meets death again. And he hears, he hears that 1,000 people have passed away. So he becomes so angry and he asks that, but you told me you're going to take only 100. Why did 1,000 people die? And he said, yes, I kept to my word. I, I did take 100, but anxiety or worry took the rest. And the man said, wow. Well, I said, I mean, that was, I mean, just planning to take 100. But we can know, we can also attest, as I said earlier on, what anxiety is doing. Uh, to people, I mean, causing premature death here and there. So, as I said, anxiety is counterproductive. But at the beginning, I made that statement that focusing on God's love and care is the surest way uh, to combat anxiety. So, what does this focus look like? Uh, from what we read, it said that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. From what Jesus said, um, one thing that we, we, we have to know, if we want to combat or overcome anxiety, uh, my senior pastor, uh, one of my senior pastors said this years ago, and it stuck with me for a long time, that if you want to overcome anxiety, you need to understand that God knows 
He, he cares and he can do something about whatever you are facing. So he knows. He cares and he can do something about it. And he said that when you are settled in your spirit that this is your conviction, anxiety will run away. And from this uh, scripture, from what Jesus said, that God knows that you need these things because he cares for the, you know, the creation. And since he cares for them, he cares for you. And if he can take care of them, then he can take care of you and your family and your needs. So when you know that, then it keeps your heart in peace. And focusing on God's love and care in this way will help you combat anxiety. And then the other part where Jesus was ending is that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Now, if you look at verse 32 and verse 33, there is a repetition of the word seek uh, over there. You can see the Gentiles seek after all these things. And then he said, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Now, in the original language, the word seek, even though the, 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 the root word is the same, is a different word that they use for the two verses. In the first one, which is seek, the Gentile seeking, the meaning of the word there is that when you are seeking frantically, you are diligently or you are frantically seeking something, you are craving for it, and you are just searching and going around, um, desperately trying to get something. Um, there is no object, there is no specific purpose to the seeking. In the second one, when Jesus said, I seek ye first, in the original language, the idea is to seek in order to find, by meditating, by pondering, by inquiring into something. So you are seeking with an object in mind. You know, when you look at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking about the Beatitudes. And he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, that blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So this kind of seeking is something that is guaranteed, that when you seek, God will give you. you know, now in our Lord's Prayer, we just prayed that our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven, right? So the will of God is that his kingdom will come on earth. And what is his kingdom? His kingdom and his his reign or his will is that righteousness will prevail in your communities, in your home, in your church, in your nation. So when you are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, definitely uh, he will add other things and he will keep you in peace. And how so? Because when you are seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, you know that you are in his will. So it keeps you in peace. When you are in the will of God, you experience the peace of God. And that is what he wants to do. And when you are seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, you know that you are just partnering with him and he is doing the work. Paul told the Philippian church that uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But then he said that, for it is God who works in you both to will and act according to his good pleasure. So the righteousness that he's producing in you is from the spirit. It's not your own power. And because of that, you are at peace. And the righteousness he's producing in your family and in your community it's, it's, it's because of his power. It's because of his you know, grace and his mighty hand and his provision. So you are at peace because you know that the results actually come from God. The success comes from God. So you do your best. So this morning, I just came to encourage all of us that uh, you might be a teacher, a grandfather, grandmother. Uh, you might be working um, anywhere uh, in this world. But when you align everything that you're doing, when you conform all that you're doing to the will of God, when you do that with the mindset that I want to glorify God, I want God's will to prevail in my home, in my church, and in my community, you are at peace because you are focusing on God's loving care. His loving care not just for you, but for his um, people. So that is what I, I wanted us to um, think about um, this morning, that focusing on God's loving care uh, is the surest way uh, to combat anxiety. I want to ask some few questions, even as I bring my uh, message to an end, that um, how do you see life? I mean, how do you really consider life? Uh, for some of us, as, as I said, life is really about what you have, you know, and um, how, 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 what, what, does, what does your passion 
um, say about you? What are you so passionate about? Are you passionate about God's righteousness, his justice, his grace um, in your life and in, your li- in the life of your family? And, um, and it, w- w- what, what you seek in life, how does it influence the way you conduct yourself? And these are things that if you think about, you know, you ponder very well and then you answer them, it will help you to know whether you are focusing on God's love and care or you're just focusing on yourself um, and then your own desires. So may God help us this morning um, to seek He first, seek Him first, uh, seek His righteousness and seek His um, kingdom. And then may God help us to acknowledge that um, He knows, He cares, and He can do something about that. May God help us to focus on His love and care and then enable us to overcome anxiety. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding Guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus as we meditate on these. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. So in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, for this um, word. Continue to help us um, to overcome anxiety even as we focus on you and your loving care and your kingdom and your righteousness. Enable us and remind us of these even as we walk through the end of the year and as we enter 2020. May we walk um, through 2020, anxiety-free, in Jesus' name. Amen.